Good morning. Thank you all for coming uh, to our event today, where we are going to probably delve into a topic which, in the policy community, is little explored. Certainly the subject of black men is often talked about, and connecting black men to good jobs is often talked about, but particularly the transportation sector as a way to uh, grow the number of and availability of good jobs for black men, not just as a temporary uh, stimulus measure to address high unemployment in the African American community, but really to set the stage for uh, long-term growth in living standards for black men is a, an underexplored topic, and we're pleased that you all are here to join us and that we've got such a tremendous panel to explore these issues. We're going to keep things brief since we are starting a little bit late due to some technical difficulties. Thank you all for your indulgence. So I will begin just by introducing our moderator who will get things started for us this, after, this morning. Uh, she, excuse me, is uh, Linda Harris, who is with the Center for Law and Social Policy, and there she is the Director of Youth Policy. Linda has more than a quarter century of experience. She started when she was just a young girl, um, working on a variety of... <laughs> Working in a variety of uh, workforce development initiatives, she has, uh, she has worked for Baltimore City, working for the office of the mayor, doing a lot of economic development, and she has also uh, co she's the co-chair of the Campaign for Youth, which is an alliance of national organizations which is seeking to uh, raise awareness of youth who fall outside of the labor market mainstream. So she's an excellent person to guide our discussion today, Linda Harris. Yeah, that quarter of a century thing made me feel ancient. <laughs> but it's actually been more than that, but who's counting? Um, I'm really delighted to um, facilitate and moderate um, this panel discussion, which I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, forward to just um, having seen some of the presentations. Um, the Center for Law and Social Policy, some of you may know, we've been in this space for 40 years of um, developing policy solutions that impact the lives of low-income people. But specifically in the arena of youth policy, we have concentrated on what do we do about the situation of disconnected youth in communities of high high youth distress. And more recently, um, we've uh, also put a laser focus on that issue of young men of color, in particular young black men, um, their labor market education situation. About two years ago, we um, issued a publication called um, Dream a World. It was part of the 2025 campaign for black men and boys. And it was a vision document. And the question was, at the time, the young um, uh, young men entering kindergarten in 2025 will be 18 years old and entering the labor force. And what do we have to do different to assure that the, such, the conversations we have um, uh, in 2025 don't sound like what we're having now? How do we um, elevate the opportunity? And part of what um, we talked about in that issuance was the that the fact we had a need to um, commit to a full-scale community-wide strategies that reach out and re-engage young black men that we have to build supported pathways that will put them on paths to the labor market where they can have opportunity for economic success, we, where we have to greatly expand the opportunities for work experience, work exposure, internships, job creation um, opportunities, and that we have to deal with this issue of how do we broker access when there is opportunity, because it's not always just a question of do the jobs exist, but how do we assure the access for young um, young black men, and how do we address some of the unfair hiring practices that are there? We did a subsequent paper called um, Building Post-Secondary Pathways for Low-Income Young Men of Color, where there we highlighted the importance that community plays in assembling the systems and the resources and adapting the policies to make these kinds of things happen at scale and the role that federal policy and state policy has to play in building the capacity of communities. Now, I put all of this in, pers um, I put this out there because this is what is near and dear to our work, but the one thing that we recognize that without vibrant sectors of the economy, without access to those sectors, none of this is going to work. And that's what's exciting about today's discussion um, that, that's going to happen, because we're talking about an industry that has opportunities, that have jobs, that may be and is amenable to how can we provide opportunity for young black men. 
and um, how do we use the industry, the transportation sector, to deliver these young men to futures of economic prog um, um, promise. And so I'm excited about those intersections as we talk. Our panelists represent a rich assembly of expertise and experience in this arena, and we'll talk about how the transportation infrastructure may hold promise for advancing economic opportunity for young black men. Um, we talked about foregoing the bios and interest of time. I want to um, uh, send you to um, the, uh, you know, the materials that you have for websites where you can get the bios and more background on each of the presenters. But I'm going to introduce them in order, and each one of them will speak for approximately 10 minutes, and then we're going to open up for questions. We have Algernon Austin, who's the director of, of the program on race, ethnicity, and the economy at the Economic Policy Institute. Second, we will have Michelle Holder, who's a senior labor market analyst for the Community Service Society of New York. Then we're going to have Anita Hairston, who's a senior, a senior associate for transportation policy at PolicyLink. And then Jeff Brooks, um, who is um, Administrative Vice President and Director of the Transit Division for the Transport, Transport Workers Union of America, and Brian Turner, who's Executive Director of the Transportation Learning Center, will um, do a joint presentation. Um, uh, lots of pa uh, a packed agenda, and um, we're going to actually ask Algernon to start. Great. Uh, good morning to you all. Thank you all for, for coming out this early in the morning. Um, and as I'm going to move so that one, I can better see that and also that I can get my blood flowing. Can people hear me? Good. Um, okay, so I'm talk, going to talk about uh, transportation infrastructure as a mechanism for good jobs for black men. As the announcement to this um, uh, event mentioned, black men have the highest unemployment rates by race and by gender. Uh, 
construction, building your numbers in construction, uh, building your numbers in manufacturing is another important mechanism. Uh, we're not going to talk about those today. But the third option is to grow the construction, the transportation sector. Since black men are uh, being able to get those jobs, if you have a large <coughs> transportation sector, that's another mechanism uh, that we can use to improve outcomes for, for black men. <clears throat> Although black men are underrepresented, severely underrepresented in construction, that does not mean that they're not there. Uh, and we can see here we have some very rough estimates of job losses uh, over since the Great Recession 2007 to 2011. And you can see black men lost significant numbers of construction jobs. And the construction industry faced significant declines. Everyone got hit, including, including the uh, black men in the construction industry. Uh, so about a quarter of the losses in this time period are due to black men losing jobs in construction. So if we can rebuild the construction industry, we will really have a positive effect on putting black men back to work, uh, black construction workers back to work. The thing is also to keep in mind, when you have a big construction project, a big transportation infrastructure project, you're going to need supplies and materials shipped to the construction site. You're going to need uh, waste, debris, other materials shipped away from the, the construction site. That's going to require transportation. So big construction sites, big construction projects uh, don't simply produce construction jobs. They also produce transportation jobs, moving the supplies uh, and equipment to and from the site. Uh, a lot of construction work involves assembling manufactured materials. Uh, so you're also going to produce manufacturing jobs. So uh, infrastructure projects, not only do they produce jobs for people in construction, they also produce jobs for people in transportation, for people in manufacturing. Uh, the projects need accountants, they need administrative assistants, they need attorneys. So these, it's important to realize both the, the direct jobs that are created, but also the, the indirect jobs, the support and supply jobs that are created, uh, that are important. So um, a big transportation infrastructure project will not only put uh, black men in construction back to work, but it will also be beneficial for black men in trans transportation and manufacturing uh, because of those uh, indirect job creation. <clears throat> uh, another important reason that we should be talking about this is that our, we have severe infrastructure needs. This is our infrastructure grades from 2009 uh, by the American Society of Civil Engineers. You can see they're all very poor grades. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any real significant improvement. We have a lot of uh, workers in, that need jobs and have severe uh, infrastructure needs. So now is, is really the best time to, to uh, do these types of projects. Uh, now, over uh, in recent years, EPI has done analyses of different types of infrastructure plans. And in these uh, analyses, they looked at what share of all the jobs created, what share would go to different demographic groups. They've done analysis, analysis to figure out well, what kind of jobs are available. Uh, and here, uh, I won't go into too much detail it's about what the plans all right, I can tell you some more. I'll speak a little bit about one in particular. But these are four different plans. Um, and you can see these are the share of estimated share of African American jobs. And you can see they're all positive. So it ranged from 9% of all the jobs we go, uh, we estimate would go to African Americans to as high as 14%. The red line represents the 11%. That's the share of blacks in the <coughs> So if you're above that 11%, that means you're, you're doing some work, some slight work to reduce the unemployment disparity. So for, for, for blacks, 
the, the, the ideal infrastructure project is something that's big, that's going to create a lot of jobs that will put uh, people to work, but also that has a, a larger share of jobs that will go to African Americans because that can help reduce some of this disparity. To remember the first slide where you see uh, places where blacks or black men have unemployment rates of 20% higher. Um, to reduce some of that disparity, you need uh, uh, a share above the, the red line. Um, we haven't done any systematic analysis, but in, among these uh, and among some others, the, the projects that have a significant public transit component do the best in terms of the share of, of jobs for, for black workers. Uh, so that's part of the reasons why we're looking at infrastructure, and particularly public transit infrastructure, because in both the terms of the direct and the indirect jobs, uh, they do a good job. They, they're effective at, um, okay, I have to speed up, <laughs> at getting jobs for African Americans. Uh, a little bit, FTA, so the FTA transit backlog, that's my title for it. It's the Federal Transportation Administration uh, did an assessment of how much, uh, of all of our public transit systems, how much do we need to spend to repair it? Um, so that's what that, that project is. That's why it's big uh, and it's public transit uh, does a good job uh, at, in terms of the share of black men. Uh, these jobs are 74% male. Uh, the majority uh, require high school diploma or less. Uh, so they're, they're a good sign for them to be reaching a, a black male population. Um, this is the wage, wage distribution. Basically, most of the, if you take all the, the, the wage distribution in the United States, cut it into five even pieces, um, and, and then look at the, the layout of the jobs, you can see the majority of the jobs are giving you sort of medium wage to very high wage. So there are good jobs in terms of the wages that they offer. Um, and so in conclusion, so depending on the type of investments, black men can get a significant share of jobs, as, as I showed, the, 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 the sort of first look suggests that public transit in, investments are particularly good in terms of the share of jobs that will go to blacks. Most of the jobs are giving you good job wages. Um, remember that infrastructure investments, uh, when you build, if you purchase more buses, build a, a, a subway system, you're going to need people to drive those buses, repair those buses, uh, be train conductors. So infrastructure investments also can directly create transportation jobs, or can be part of the, the funding stream to create transportation jobs. Another point, um, when you have a good public transportation system, African Americans who may not own private vehicles, this is mobility, this, this improves people's access to jobs also. So that's a, an additional benefit uh, that you get from making public transit investments. And that's all. Okay, thanks, Alan. I have some questions. Would you grab one of them? Yeah, I'll grab one of them. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, Christian? Do you have mine keyed up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm having I'm having a little difficulty seeing the screen because of the the flag. Uh, so I'm just going to Okay, good morning. 
So as Linda mentioned, my name is Michelle Holder. I'm the Senior Labor Market Analyst at the Community Service Society of New York, which is a 168-year-old anti-poverty organization in New York City. I'm here to talk about black male employment in the transportation sector in New York City, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the construction sector in New York City. And um, as Algernon uh, talked about, he sort of gave the overview nationwide. I'm going to give you all a glimpse of what these sectors look like in New York City and how black male employment is represented in these sectors. My focus is going to be on the transportation sector, but again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the construction sector. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was pressing both buttons, but neither would move, so. Okay, so um, before I get into that, I just want to talk about um, the, the unemployment rates that Algernon mentioned, the very high African-American male unemployment rates. And so um, there's obviously a reason for that, and that was the recession. Um, the impact of the recession was deleterious for the country, but it was especially disparate for, for, for black men. And as this chart shows, if you look at the percentage point change in unemployment during the recession for black men, it was almost nine percentage points, uh, higher than any other uh, gender, race, and ethnic demographic group. You'll also see that going into the recession, black male unemployment was already high at 9%. At the end of the recession in, in 2009, it was almost 18 percent. And so what, we were ta what we're talking about is at the end of the recession, black men in New York City, one in five black men in New York City were, were unemployed. That's essentially depression level unemployment rates. Okay, uh, next slide, Christian. So today, or really last year, looking at uh, 2011, the unemployment rates did decline for most demographic groups in the city, and it did decline for, for black men. In fact, uh, it declined the most for black men, 3.3 percentage points. But as of last year, it was still high at 14.6%. So whereas New York City doesn't rank among the cities that Algernon laid out at the beginning of his presentation, it's still quite high. Next slide, Christian. And I did want to make a uh, mention of the issue of long-term unemployment in the black community in New York City, because I think that this is forgotten in discussions about uh, joblessness. Long-term unemployment has become a pervasive feature of the post-recession landscape, and the black community in New York City has been the most impacted in terms of race and ethnic groups. What this chart shows is that by men and women, black non-Hispanics have been out of work long-term uh, at the highest percentage, and by long term I mean out of work for more than six months. Nearly 60% of black New Yorkers who are jobless, who have lost their job, have been unemployed for, six, for longer than six months. And you'll see that, again, looking at the chart for both men and women, it's the highest of any race and ethnic group. Okay, so I wanted to kind of just lay out the unemployment picture for black men in New York City before I got into the uh, sectoral discussion. And so first, let me lay out what, what this chart is saying. So this chart is looking at uh, total employment in New York City by industry as of August. And as you'll see, the, it's a pie chart. Um, I'm just going to sort of focus in on the transportation sector, which is in blue toward the right. And then there's the construction and manufacturing sectors, which is kind of at uh, the center of the chart. I did combine those sectors because the share of employment in New York City in those sectors is, is rather small. So I combined it for expediency. As you'll see, though, according to this chart, the transportation, transportation sector um, constitutes a very small share of jobs in New York City, just 2.6%. And likewise, both the construction and manufacturing sectors combined only comprise about 5% of jobs in New York City. Uh, Christian, the next slide. Okay, so now this chart is looking at the distribution of all men employed in New York City by, by industry. 
And again, pointing specifically to the construction and manufacturing sector, you'll see that uh, the share of men in the transportation sector is 8.5%. Now compare that to the previous chart, which had trans the transportation sector at 2.6%. Also in the construction and manufacturing sectors, the share of men employed in those sectors is 13.4%. And again, comparing it to the previous chart, which we don't have to go back to, I'll just give you the number, comparing it to 4.8% for construction and manufacturing, you'll see that uh, men dominate both of those industries in New York City. Okay, Christian. Um, now, this chart looks at employed black men in New York City by industry. And again, zeroing in on the transportation sector and the construction and manufacturing sector, you'll see that first and foremost, black men are well, not only well represented in the transportation sector, but they're, they're over represented. 15.5% of all black men employed in New York City are employed in the transportation sector. That's compared to a sector which only comprises 2.6% of all jobs in New York City. So black men are, are very much overrepresented in that sector. In terms of construction and manufacturing, 11.2% uh, of all black men are in those sectors combined. Now it may look at first glance as if black men are overrepresented in those sectors, but what you should bear in mind is that, again, those sectors are very male, heavily male dominated, and so, if you look at the previous chart, which we don't need to go back to, but all, all men employed in New York City, of all men employed in New York City, 13.4% were in construction and manufacturing. Compared to, thank you, compared to 11.2% of black men. So black men are somewhat underrepresented in the construction industry if you look at the share of all men employed in, in those sectors in New York City. Okay, uh, next chart. Now, so I think that um, the case is really quite clear that in New York City, the, transport the, the transportation sector has been really the biggest employer for black men. Um, so what do the wages look like for, for those sectors where black men are underrepresented and black men are overrepresented? The transportation sector overall wages last year were almost $50,000, um, which is about the median uh, household income level for the U.S. across the country. However, if you look at a sector like retail trade where black men are also overrepresented in New York City, you'll see that the wages are quite, quite are much lower at 35, almost $36,000 a year. Where black men are underrepresented, for example, in professional and business services, you'll see that the wages are quite high. And that's also the, the, the case for the so-called fire sector, which is finance, insurance, and real estate. Um, I didn't put those wages here, but, but it's actually a lot higher than the annual average wage for professional and business services. So as Algernon mentioned, the, the transportation sector is not only one that's been welcoming for black men and has been amenable to black male employment, but it's also one that, that pays decently uh, compared to other sectors where black men are, are overrepresented in New York City. Um, Christian, can you go to the next slide? Got it, okay. And so let me zero in on even, even more so the transportation sector in terms of the distribution of black men across occupations in that sector. And you'll see that most black men in that sector are drivers, engineers, attendants, about 62% of black men in transportation in New York City are employed in those occupations. Then second to that would be office and administrative support at 17.6%. You'll see that in the, in the occupations within transportation which tend to pay the highest, which are in management as well as installation, maintenance and repair, Black men are, are somewhat underrepresented at, in management at 1.8% and installation maintenance and repair at 6.2%. So even though we can talk about the fact that the transportation sector has been one that's been 
accessible to black men, even when you look at the, the spread of occupations, there is some disparities between low paying occupations within the transportation sector and high paying occupations. Black men tend to comprise the, the drivers, the, as, as, this, the, as this chart delineates drivers, engineers, attendants, that t tends to pay less than the management occupations as well as the maintenance and repair occupations. So I think this gives a kind of a broad overview of what it looks like for black men employed in that industry in New York City. Again, it, it, it's an industry that employs the most black men in New York City. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, um, one, only one other industry beats that, and that would be the education, health services, and social assistance industry. Then second to that would be the transportation sector. Um, so Algernon talked a little bit about, or actually he talked a lot about transportation investment uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, really what I wanted to show you is, is, is what it looked like for black men it, in terms of the spread of employment, not only in construction, but in transportation. Thank you.
uh, these local hiring provisions and targeted hiring provisions for projects of different sizes. Um, and it's really been about building relationships between the community and labor, uh, from training providers, all of those working together around one team. <coughs> Three weeks 
uh, ahead of schedule, $11 million under budget, and they well exceeded the goal that they set of 16% uh, disadvantaged business enterprise participation because they had all the folks at the table. So definitely take a look at that. Um, I, I, and again, I think we know what the solutions are, and I think that transportation is a really great starting point. Um, but given the high level of unemployment that my colleagues raised, um, I, I, I want to I want to offer a frame of maybe setting our sights even higher and thinking about infrastructure banks, the vehicles for loans and grant programs um, that can build highways, transit, energy, <coughs> wastewater treatment plants, uh, schools, parks, etc. Um, and when you look beyond transportation opportunities, huge. the largest uh, a grant program for expanding transit new starts of $2 billion. Uh, in the President's last budget, uh, there the proposal for an infrastructure bank, such as 2012 budget, $30 billion. Just imagine the, the, the opportunities that are there. And that really gets to Algernon's point around um, the underrepresentation in construction and manufacturing. So that's a real opportunity that we should be watching. Uh, there's work going on in Chicago, uh, around infrastructure banks. There's also a West Coast infrastructure bank that looks at um, how to raise resources uh, in California, Oregon, and Washington. Those are things that I think we should be watching. Um, and I would just say that um, I think we should pay attention to policy. You know, we should pay attention to policy. I'm really struck by um, what uh, Algernon presented around these different plans, okay? And so if you have different plans in the end, Now, this one on the right, um, you may not be able to see it from here, but everything's below the red line, okay? And where we are today with the newest uh, transportation bill we have is basically status quo, where we were before. So we're below the red line. So I think that this is really uh, issues a challenge and a call to action for us to really seek out uh, transformational uh, policy reform or transportation. We need to really pay attention to that, and then also even set our sights higher to look. Uh, start with transportation and see if there's opportunities for us to move beyond. Thank you, and I look forward to this session. So let's see if we can make this thing work. So we're going to talk about um, capital investment as including uh, human beings, not just, uh, not just the things that get built, uh, and uh, very much policy and program, which is uh, the business we're in. Um, let's see if this will work. There we go. Um, transportation is one of the faster growing segments of the overall U.S. economy in terms of jobs. Uh, public transportation, uh, transit, which Jeff and I are going to talk about, uh, is one of the fastest growing parts of the overall transportation industry. So it's a, it's a good place to pay attention. Uh, Department of Labor is projecting 38 percent growth in employment. Uh, transit rail ridership in particular is growing like crazy. And you also have an older workforce where about 40% of the current incumbents are expected, of the frontline workers, the people who maintain and operate transit systems, are expected to retire in the next 10 years. That means if you combine the growth and the retirement, about 80% of the jobs that exist today are going to have to be rolled over in new opportunities for hiring in the next 10 years. That's, that's, that's huge. Um, and we, we know that... Um, Transit, in particular, is an important and interesting industry from the point of view of this discussion because big transit systems exist in big cities, big urban locations with large urban populations and the concentrations of minorities uh, and, and youth, urban youth, who uh, need much better outcomes than they're getting today. Transit provides 
family supporting jobs in general, uh, the average wages in transit, which is, by the way, more than 90% union represented around the country, uh, are over $45,000 per job. Um, you have a strong union representation. Um, and in particular, um, uh, I'll jump forward a little bit. With 18% of all um, transit jobs um, being held by African Americans, in the big cities, it's much higher numbers. In New York City, for example, 73% uh, of the employees of New York City Transit, the country's largest transit agency, are people of color. Uh, and that's reflected in the unions that represent the frontline workforce, uh, where if you go uh, up and down the East Coast, the Midwest, local union after local union has an African-American president, many African-American leaders on their executive boards. Uh, they're tuned in to pay attention to these, to these issues in a way that can be very productive. Uh, and while we know that 18.4% uh, of the jobs in the industry uh, nationally are held by African Americans, less than 4% of the more skilled frontline jobs, the maintenance technicians, uh, are uh, held by African Americans. So what does all this mean in terms of policy, in terms of what we can do as a country in, in trying to shape the future? Uh, the transit industry has, oh, I'm not advancing these slides, I'm sorry. i just jump straight to this. The transit industry has one of the lowest levels of investment in skill development, in uh, training or development of human capital. It's a very important term. One of the lowest levels of investment of any industry. Um, the, we talk about an average in the U.S. of about 2% of payroll going to uh, human capital investment. Uh, in companies that are very successful, it's 3, 4, 5%. Uh, Federal Highway has set a goal of 3% of investment because, by the way, they too have got lots of people retiring. We need to be training up that next generation. Uh, transit is somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8%, 0 0.6 or 0.8% of payroll being invested in the development of human capital. And yet, if you go to something like, the, like DOT's Workforce Summit uh, held in April here in Washington, um, well, now I'm going, to, I'm, going to jump, I'm going to jump forward one more and tie this together in a better way. But what does federal policy say about the level of investment in human capital? Basically, nothing. Um, the uh, capital investment program in the Surface Transportation Act, and this goes back 50 years, is only about investing in things. There's almost nothing there about investing in the human capital, uh, without which the physical capital can't do anything useful. Physical capital can't run itself, it can't operate on time, it can't operate efficiently, it can't operate safely without the human capital, the skill and the talent and the knowledge that's needed from human beings to make this, to make this go forward. So federal policy is spending less than one-tenth of one percent in transit on human capital investment. Uh, and so when you go back to what's happening in the current level of investment in the workforce in the industry, you get what you pay for. The federal government is telling the industry, buy new buses, buy new trains, build new bridges, re revive that track, build that new line, but very little about making sure that the skills are there. But when we go to the, back to that DOT Workforce Summit, the leaders of the railroad industry, the highway industry, the transit industry are all saying, our biggest need is their frontline workforce. We need to invest in training programs for the 80% of the workforce that operates and maintains our transit systems. So uh, we need to find ways to make human capital an integral part of federal programs for transit and other transportation sectors. And with that money, we need to concentrate on programs that can reach out and build career pathways and, and connect to career ladders. At our center, the Transportation Learning Center, we have built a framework over the last dozen years of national training standards, apprenticeships, 
uh, systems that can be used if there were more money to invest in, in training, but there isn't very much. Um, that system of training, apprenticeship training standards, hands-on learning opportunities can be rotated and applied to people who, are, who could come into the industry, to high schools, to middle schools, to people in the community who could come into transit and who could come from the community served by transit, which are these large cities. So um, we're looking at two major emphases. First of all, real money for human capital investment. Second of all, quality career pathway programs, partnering transit agencies and unions with high schools and middle schools, hands-on and problem-solving approaches to learning, which could solve a lot of issues faced by young people who are dropping out because they're hands-on learners, mentoring, job shadowing, internships, uh, college credit for uh, training that's done to national standards as we've been developing, um, and all of that. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Brooks, who's going to talk about what he has done is probably the single most effective leader in the U.S. transit industry in building not just career ladder programs for today's transit employees, but those career pathway partnerships to bring young people from the community into the industry and expand opportunities for quality careers. Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I just want to put myself on a timer. Uh, I'll just give you a brief background of my history. Uh, I came into a transportation under Amtrak in 1980, uh, came in as a track laborer. As a result, uh, I ended up running track equipment, which gave me the opportunity when I left Amtrak, I worked both jobs for uh, about two, three years, I went to SEPTA. I'm a native of Philadelphia. And I became a, uh, not in the, the normal path of transportation, I came into uh, the track department under SEPTA. Uh, that's labor work. As a result, what we did was I, I saw uh, an imbalance when it came to the labor work and when it came to skilled labor. And it became important for me at some point because of my background with Amtrak to go into that same field which was running equipment and that which I did at Amtrak I went into uh, construction equipment I ran construction equipment for close to almost 30 years for uh, which is heavy equipment cranes backhoes up to 200 tons uh, loaders and so forth so on but what became uh, uh, apparently clear when I got there, that there were not a lot of people that looked like me. There were drivers of operators of vehicles, but there were no heavy equipment operators, the highest skill level. And as a result, uh, that got me involved in our union. And by 1984, I was a section, uh, uh, section officer, and then by 86, I was a chairman. And by 1990, I was on staff of our union. And from 90 to 2001, I was elevated through the uh, process from vice president to recording secretary, but what became more important to me, I promised myself by the time I got to anywhere in there, no, had no idea I'd be president of the local, but I became president of the local in 2004, and what became important to me was to change the face of our union. Change the face of our union, not just for, for black males, but for, for minorities in general. Uh, I was successful in bringing th uh, three females, one uh, Caucasian uh, white woman who was on welfare and was on nationally on 60 Minutes at one time and became a track equipment operator and still is to this day. I was successful in bringing in two uh, black females who one of them became the first and only construction equipment operator under uh, uh, Incepta. And one is a train operator to this day in, in transportation. But as I saw that that was a, 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 an issue and we didn't have uh, uh, a conduit between us and the school district as well, I started looking at, as I became president, that our workforce was aging. 
And as Brian alluded to, 40% of our members within the next 10 years were going to be in a uh, mode of retirement. And that was in the high skill level, the first class, the specialists, the technicians, and so forth and so on. So as a result, uh, I went into the school district, sat down with uh, individuals, sat down with the mayor of Philadelphia at the time, the governor, and other legislators. And what, what became important was a partnership with the school district of Philadelphia, Transport Workers Union, and SEPTA. But, but more than that, I thought it was, we couldn't start at the high school level. We had to start before that. You can't catch children at, at high school and expect them to go right into those careers when they had no background. So we, we, I got a commitment for us to go into the middle schools. And as a result, those middle schools, we created an internship, which still exists to this day. That internship uh, was a conduit for them to get to the training, but it didn't get them the job per se, or it got them in entry level jobs and wouldn't get them any further once they got there. So by 2005, my first uh, negotiated contract as president, I negotiated an apprenticeship. And that apprenticeship gave them the bridge to, to prevent anyone from just going to the low level jobs or even the existing employees and members of my union staying in those low level jobs and, and not becoming electricians, plumbers, carpenters, and so forth so on. I'm proud to say one of the individuals I went to school with, uh, uh, I won't mention how many years ago because I'm 56, but uh, I, I will say that, that uh, it's, it was necessary for us to move forward and to get us to a place where we needed to be, and she has become a, 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 a plumber and now has retired from there, as well as I have. So with that, I just want to give you some, just want to give you a little insight. Uh, I appreciate your help in being here, but I appreciate more than anything the, the ability for us to be able to move forward and possibly get, move this uh, nation in a, in a direction where we can have uh, training for individuals who, a voice for the voiceless. Thank you. We tried to get a whole lot into the into this session, and so um, I, I have lots of questions, but I'm not going to actually um, give my questions because I want to open it up to the um, audience here um, to go deeper with your questions for any of our panelists. Mm -hmm. And can you identify who, um, who you are? Where you're from? Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Chris Merrill. I'm here because I'm, I'm the writer's advisor. Training, 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 
Other, thank you. Uh huh. Yes, great. Uh huh. Okay. And you are? Over here. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I actually think you look at 